message for the week. Let's begin the service tonight, 240, please, and let's stand together in our songbook. I will sing of my Redeemer, and it's wondrous love for me, 240 on the first now. I will sing. blessing to see each and every one of you in church tonight, and I love Wednesday night, and uh, just to be with God's people, and uh, to sing of our Redeemer, as we just did. What a blessing. We have a special guest with us, one of our college students, uh, Jonathan Busme from India, has his father and brother here, Stanley and Jason, and uh, his father, Stanley, is an evangelist there in India and is coming early for our Pastors and Workers Conference. And so thank you for being with us uh, this evening. It's going to be a wonderful service together tonight. We close out the month of February, and we're excited about Sunday, the first uh, service in the month of March. And, of course, we kick off our Pastors and Workers Conference. But let's pray together and ask the Lord to meet with us in a special way. Father in heaven, our hearts have been so blessed these Wednesday nights as we've been in Romans chapter 8. And Lord, we are anticipating you doing a great work in our midst again this evening. I pray, Lord, that we would sense your touch upon every aspect of this service. Thank you for, Lord, what you've done in our hearts. I pray that you'd work mightily again tonight. May you receive the glory and honor for what you do, for we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. 523, please. In your songbook there, all oh, we're singing well tonight. 523 on the first. I heard it all. Praise 
God. All right, on the last together now. But on the hardest days I cry, oh Lord, isn't it about time? But the potter knows the clay, how much pressure it can take, how many times around the wheel, till there's submission to His will. Oh! 
he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain or pleasure, mingling toil with peace and Himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he gladly bears and cheers me. He whose name is Counselor and Power. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble to take as from a father's hand one by one the days the moments fleeting till I reach the promised land till I reach the promised specials for tonight. Let's sing together 214, please. 214. Oh, he came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me on the first 214. The calm that separated me. Christ my Lord.
vessels. God bless you. I'm glad you're in church. The ushers are coming through with the bulletin for tonight. Raise your hand if up in the balcony, the lower floor, we've missed you. Be sure, certain to thank the workers with your kids when you pick them up tonight. And uh, they're in their children's program, sixth grade and below. And uh, we're very grateful for those workers that would work a job, I would imagine, every one of them today. And yet, uh, go in there and work with your kids. It's wonderful. It's been a good day in all the chapels and the services. And it's been wonderful to be around here with no mask on today. And to God be the glory. And uh, praise God for that. I do want to remind you that we have a, a Servants of the Lord broadcast on the uh, live broadcast Friday morning at 8 o'clock. And the various Servants of the Lord are going to be stopping by. We'll talk to them about serving God and uh, look forward to that. And that's in preparation for, of course, Pastor's Conference. Uh, number four, the special choir practice. And I'm looking forward to hearing you. I'll be there briefly in and out. But uh, right, um, we come here to this auditorium, 9 o'clock from 9 to 1030, choir and orchestra. You know who's supposed to be there as we prepare for the camp meeting. We look forward to that. Men's prayer meeting, number five, Saturday night at, at, uh, five, at, uh, at 8 o'clock. It's going to be wonderful. Now, number six is important. And if you're going to be a delegate, let's register here in the next day or two. Let's get that taken care of. And uh, as we've been trying to talk about, I, I'll just be so disappointed if you're not here. Our offering tonight, by the way, before we go further, is for pastors and workers' conference. You know, pastors are wonderful, and I don't think they're uh, sitting on the verge of, I want to quit the ministry. I know there's this recent statistic said young and old pastors, 40% want out. Well, I don't want out, and I don't know very many that want out. But it, it, this thing for you, it's been very COVID for two years, been very wearing on God's people. And you know, for the, uh, the men of God, it's been very wearing. They've been trying to figure out how to keep their churches going. Here's, here's what's happened in all churches, all states, and in foreign countries. I think of some of the missionaries I've talked to, the moving out of the areas has been just amazing all over the world. Uh, here in this large, large country, and large, large city, the dear missionaries said, we have just lost them to Singapore. And, and they begin to list the countries where they've left, just gone because of the huge restrictions. And others have found out that they can move and live cheaper and still worldwide work their job. We have scores of people that still work in the Silicon Valley. Now they live in Florida and, and Texas and in Minnesota and New England and Ohio, you name it. And that's just part of pastoring. So you can spin from there and say it's all hopeless. Well, I tell you what, Sunday morning, uh, you look, this bal the balcony's never been full and the lower floor. It's God's bringing folks back in. Uh, we had a hard time getting going with our adult classes. And you know what? All the adult classes are back. They're, they're, they're doing great. Big day last Sunday again and tithes and offerings and people going to the ministry and a lot of good things. But I'm laboring this because many pastors are coming weary and they're frustrated and they're tired and everything's a battle, whether it's their city, their county, their state, and we're not the only one. And so I hope you'll know that you are so important. You are more important than I am. Pastors want to see lay people being ushers and in the orchestra and security. And they want to see a choir. It's hard to tell you this. Most choirs are not back yet. And if choirs are back, I just know the numbers. There's four men and nine ladies. It's just an amazing thing to see a full choir. But I don't want it just full on Sunday morning, Sunday night. God's going to use you Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Amen. And so our offering goes for Pastors and Workers Conference, and we never charge enough. We're not done with the bulletin, but we never charge enough. We lose tens and tens of thousands of dollars. But what are you going to do with that member that called on Monday and said, I just put $10,000 in to help with Pastors Conference? That's what happens. And can I tell you, perhaps, and I am not asking for anything for any of us, ever. You, you, 
You, you, you go way overboard. But you can go through the word of God. God blesses with the oil continuing in the cruise when you take care of God's men. And we are going to have the privilege tonight to take care of the servants of the Lord, Amen. God's servants. Amen. Now, we're not going to do like they did for Elisha and build a little chamber and a little candlestick and a bed and a place for him to stop when he passed through town. But we're going to invest in them for this next week while they're here. And uh, there'll be many Sunday. Please, when they sit by you, you greet them. And let's be there. Number, number, uh, number seven is a big announcement. We need you to park uh, at Oracle. And parents, if you're teenagers or college-age students drive cars, they need to help us all week long. You know, um, we're so glad, Jonathan, to have your family here. And they got in. We had a delegate coming, flew all the way across the world, and arrived in San Francisco yesterday. He's been in the state several times. He's, there's no blot against his life. Uh, there's a, no reason for him not to come until you get an atheist that after eight hours said, you get on a plane and go back. And that dear man was so excited about being here. And after flying all those many 16, 18 hours, he's flying back right now. And this church, we'll, we'll make sure he gets all the all the supplies, all the products. I'm gonna, but but we we must do our best to try to help these men. Our church, we like to give things away. We're gonna try to treat them like they're very, very special. I mean, very. And you're the best at it. Ushers, please come. And we're gonna ask God to give us a good offering. If you don't have it available tonight, or if you don't give online tonight, I know many of you do it right from where you're seated there. We're going to have you take care of that um, on um, Sunday. Let's all bring a gift. Brother uh, Bertram, if you will, he's going to lead us in prayer. And then um, after the offering, uh, I'm going to go sit by my wife. I've been listening to the preaching on Wednesday night, who's ever preaching, and I love it. But I feel like I always, I, it's because it's in here, but I want to be the number one cheerleader. And so, you know, I, I'm always amen and everything. And clapping my hands and fired up and woke you up there and fired you. I, I'm just, but, but I'm too loud next to my wife. So last week I moved over because I can hear her. She's doing this, you know, bless her heart. I am loud. I love being loud. Man, you know what I'm talking about. But um, so I said, you know, next week, which is tonight, I said, I'm going to sit in the balcony somewhere and just amen. But if I get an opportunity to sit with, you know, the lady that rubs my feet every night and massages my neck and makes me a nine-course meal every night. I mean, good night. And I really enjoyed those hot dogs tonight. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have one. So I'm going to go. I'm going to tone it down. Why am I saying that? Because you have to tone it up, man. All the men, give me an amen right now. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And get real happy once in a while. And praise the Lord. Uh, come on, preacher, preach it. So I'm going to sit over here like I'm in a Presbyterian church tonight. And uh, are you ready to pray? I've been waiting. You got a prayer? Yes, sir. Got it all outlined? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your many blessings upon us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be called a Christian to know that our sins are forgiven, our names are written in heaven, that this world is not our home, we're just passing through, that the troubles and cares of this life are only for a season, for soon the trumpet will sound and we'll be caught up to be with you forever in a place of joy and happiness. Now, Lord, tonight on this journey, you've given us the opportunity to be a blessing to your servants. Lord, there will be men who will gather here from all across the country, large churches, small churches, city churches. Uh, Lord, there will be those who have a staff, and there will be those who they're the only one. But Lord, whether they're great or small in the eyes of the world, they're great in your eyes. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a blessing to them. May we be a breath of fresh air. May we be an encouragement. Lord, I pray that every man who comes to this place that leaves 
every servant of you, every pastor's wife, every church member that comes, I pray that when they leave, they would go back with a greater zeal to serve you and a great anticipation to see you work in the place that you've called them to labor. Now tonight as we give, I pray that you'd help us to give out of hearts of love and gratitude for what you've done for us, for the blessings you've given us in this place, and to give with the desire and the determination to be a blessing to someone else. Pray that you'd bless each gift and each giver, and then we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. me to Romans chapter number eight again, please, tonight. Romans chapter number eight. It's been good to be in church on Wednesday night. Thank you for your faithful attendance. Always the crowd just grows as we go through the service. And by the time we get to this point, it's a good crowd. Thank you for coming and being a part of the Wednesday night service. Pray for Pastors and Workers Conference. Pastor labored that. But uh, it's very important. It's very important to those preachers that are coming and those Christians that will travel here from across the country and around the world. And really it's important for us. It's a time to get some extra meals around the table Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And let's ask God to meet with us. And Brother Jonathan, it's a blessing to have your dad and your brother here. And uh, your son's a blessing, really. He's mature. He's a good preacher. And I appreciate him. He has horrible taste in friends, as you can see there. But he's a great young man. Romans chapter number 8. We're going to look at the last seven verses of the book of Romans tonight. We'll read verse 33 down through verse number 39. And that will finish this chapter in the book of Romans. And uh, I've enjoyed being in this chapter in my own personal Bible study and then with you on Wednesday nights. And I'm praying God will encourage us again. This entire chapter really is just a chapter of encouragement. And I thought about that. Why in the world would the Lord have me spend three weeks in a row Wednesday nights on encouragement? It's been one week, and then last week, and then tonight. And then I thought, here's why. Because this coming Wednesday, Brother Martinez, we're not going to probably get that, right? we got Tony Hudson coming. So I thought maybe three weeks of encouragement will balance out one Wednesday of Brother Tony, okay? So Romans chapter number 8, verse number 33. Look what the Bible said. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are count, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, and I was studying, and one commentator said that's in the present tense, and he said that means it's a past decision that carries on and continues. So what Paul is saying is this, I had been persuaded, I am persuaded, and I'll be persuaded of this even tomorrow. He's pretty well settled on it. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature just in case somebody might say, but you didn't mention my problem. He said, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As you begin to study verse 33 down through verse number 39, Paul is giving us a section of the chapter that deals with our security. And our security in Christ has nothing to do with our performance. It has everything to do with our position. We are in 
Christ. We are in Christ eternally. We are saved eternally, and thank God we are secure eternally. Paul goes through this chapter, and basically he'll ask about six different questions, we could say, or he'll bring up six different times, different things, and says, can this separate you from the love of God? Can this separate you from the love of God? Can this category separate you from the love of God? And over and over again, he asks the questions, and then all of a sudden he just says, I'm persuaded there's nothing. No time, no place, no way, no how ever that can separate us from the love of God. Think about that line that says, wonderful things in the Bible I read, but this is the dearest that Jesus loves me. For a little while this evening, I want to preach on this thought. There's no who, no how, no way, no what, no when, no never that can separate us from the love of God. Lord, I pray that you'd help your people tonight, please. I pray for liberty to preach the message the way that you put it upon my heart. I pray that you'd encourage that one who's struggling, that one who's fearful, maybe that one who battles with doubt. I pray that we'd understand that the love of God is inescapable, it's inexhaustible, and it's inseparable. Thank you for the privilege to preach. I pray you'd use me in Jesus' name. Amen. Last year, my family and I got to use a swimming pool that was private. Nobody else was there, but we got to use it for a few days. Every point of that swimming pool was too deep for Link and my, my little boy to stand in. He doesn't know how to swim yet, so we always put <coughs> floaties on his arms, which he likes that because he thinks those are his muscles. So he likes the floaties. I'm surprised he doesn't wear them to school. But uh, he, he had to use those to get around the pool. Every point of that pool was over his head. After a while, he got a little bit more used to the water, and we convinced him to take off the floaties, and he was nervous because he can't swim, so I held him in my arms. We went around that entire pool together. Every point of that pool was over his head. At any moment, that water was too deep for him, and he would go under the level of the water, but for the fact that he was safe in the arms of his father. And here's what he determined. Here's what he would have understood. His safety was not dependent upon him or his ability to keep his head above the water. His safety was dependent upon his father and the strength of his father and his ability to keep his head above the water. Here's what I know. Salvation at every point is too deep for you. Amen. The struggles of life at every point are over your head. The storms of life at every point are too deep for you and I, but I'm glad it is not dependent upon my performance and it's not dependent upon my power, but I am safe in the arms of God every point along the journey. It's been said that Romans is the diamond ring of the Bible. And if that be true, chapter 8 must be the glisten upon the ring. I believe this is the peak or the summit of Paul's correspondence to this church in Rome. I've already told you this is a chapter of encouragement for embattled Christians. Now this chapter does not hide us from the fact that we will have adversity. But I'm glad ne neither does it leave us from the truth that we will overcome our adversity. In verse 37, the Bible says this, Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And here Paul's pen, guided by the Holy Spirit of God, gives us a chapter that I believe would steady the heart and stir up the faith of those Christians then, and it ought to do the same for you and I here tonight. Paul introduces this chapter with a phrase, and that phrase is in Christ Jesus. In fact, he begins the chapter with that phrase, and he also closes the chapter with the same phrase, in Christ Jesus. It all starts in Christ, and it's all summed up in Christ. It begins in Christ, and it ends in Christ. It is Jesus at the starting gate, and it is Jesus at the finish line. And could there be any more encouraging truth for the child of God than that is Jesus in the beginning, is Jesus throughout the journey, and is Jesus at the end, and it'll be Jesus throughout eternity. Now, as you study these 39 verses, you'll discover you can divide the chapter into three distinct divisions. In fact, I think it's three different divisions that center on three promises to the child of God. If you study out the chapter, there's a promise or division concerning our sonship. Then there's a division or promise concerning suffering. 
And then the section we're in tonight is a division concerning our security. In verse 1 through 16 is the division or section on our sonship. In those verses, we find such statements as the adoption that we have or the Spirit of God that within us cries out, Abba, Father. And that's a great Bible promise tonight that we are the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. You might be here tonight and not have an earthly family or maybe you have a dysfunctional family or maybe you have a divided family and you might not have a good earthly father or an earthly sibling or an earthly mother, but I'm glad if you're saved, we're all part of the family of God. And I'm glad that I've got a heavenly father and a heavenly city and I've got a big brother named Jesus and all of heaven is ours to look forward to. In verse 17 through 30 is the next division. It deals with our suffering. If you study it out, it talks about the glory in our suffering, God in our suffering and the goal of our suffering. It's just a fact of life that all of us will have seasons of suffering but I'm glad God's in control and is for our good and is for his glory. Here in verse 31 through 39 this section deals with our security. It talks about the fact that we are safe in the love of God which is anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I was studying this I saw the Apostle Paul acting as a shepherd, leading these believers into the perfect pasture for their life. They're having a hard time in Rome. They're a hated people. They're dealing with hell by the acre, if you will. They're hunted and persecuted. And so Paul gives them some verses on assurance. I don't doubt that their flesh felt very insecure in the city of Rome. So Paul leads them to these still waters and gives them this blessed assurance that not only are we saved for eternity, but we are inseparable from the love of God in time. That word secure means to free from danger, to keep, to get a hold of, and keep possession. The word inseparable means incapable of being parted or disjointed or to be permanently bonded. And here's my prayer tonight. My prayer is the same as Paul's. I want the Bible to give us some reassurance that no matter who it is, no matter what it is, no matter when it is, no matter what way it feels, there is never a moment, there is never a time, there is never an instant, there is never a season where the child of God will find themselves outside the circumference of God's all-encompassing love in their life. Now tonight, this is a topic that you're not going to get assured of according to your feelings. You cannot enter into this arena on the avenue of feelings. That's why so many Christians doubt. That's why so many Christians struggle. That's why so many Christians are depressed. We live too much on the feeling end of the spectrum, and that comes from our flesh. You cannot enter into this arena via your feelings. We have to venture into this area on faith in God. Faith is simply taking God at his word. In these last seven verses, Paul is at his most eloquent. Paul has a brilliant mind and a wide vocabulary, but I believe no place does he paint the word picture by inspiration of God as he paints in these closing verses of Romans chapter 8. Last week, I talked about verse 31, where Paul tells us God is for us. But now we get the conclusion of the matter. Not only is God for us, but God is always perpetually and eternally for us us. The theme of the text is the love of God in Christ Jesus. So you notice the love of God is a concentrated thing. You say, where do you find the love of God? It is in Christ Jesus. We're not talking about some fuzzy feeling. We're not talking about some new age aura. We're talking about a display of divine love that was poured out for you and I on the cross of Calvary. The basis of our security is anchored in the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ 
when he died for sinners over 2,000 years ago. So it's concentrated. The love of God is in Christ Jesus. But I like this. It is consistent. It doesn't ebb and flow. It doesn't weaken or wane. It's not on and off, but it's always there. It's there in the day and it's there in the night. It's there in the ease and there in the difficulty. It's there in the battle and there in the calm. The love of God is consistent and I'm glad the love of God is constant throughout our life. It's a great truth that God so loved the world to give us salvation, but it's a greater truth that God so loves you still to keep you secure in time and safe throughout all eternity. I think about the great hymn that says, Oh love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. The love of God intrudes upon tribulation. It invades your distress. It'll trespass in persecution. It's your feast and famine. It's your peace and peril. It's your adorning and nakedness and shield against the sword. And through Christ, Christ makes the Father and the believer inseparable by the unbreakable band of his love. When Jesus reached out on the cross of Calvary, it was more than hands outstretched to wood. It was a hand reaching out to fallen man and a hand reaching out to his heavenly Father. And when Jesus said, it is finished, he linked all those that would believe by the unbreakable band of his perpetual love. And when you and I entered into that stream of grace, the day you got saved by faith, can I say that you got wrapped up, that you got tied down, that you got caged in, that you got branded by the love of God, and now the banner over you is love. He reached out with cords of a man and drew us with bands of love. And thank God there's nothing, nowhere, no way, no how, and nobody that can never ever separate you from the love of God. He made us inseparable. The love of God is there like oxygen in the atmosphere. The love of God is there like salt in the sea. The love of God is there like stars in the sky. You take the most constant thing that you can think of in this physical realm and the love of God far surpasses the most constant thing that man could ever comprehend. It's like a calendar with no beginning and a clock with no end. It had no commencing. It'll have no conclusion. It ever runs around the face of eternity. The love of God. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. You'll find out there's no who, there's no how, there's no way, there's no what, and there's no when never that can separate you and I from the love of God. It was there in the garden when Adam sinned. He thought maybe God will not love me, but he discovered in the cool of the day as God, as God came to Adam that the love of God was there. The love of God was there in the flood as Noah bounced up and down on those tumultuous waves, but he discovered God was in the boat with him. The love of God was there when David was exiled from his throne and made his home in the cave, but he found out he had a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and the love of God was there. You'll find out Elijah, the love of God is there under that juniper tree. You think you're the only man standing? There's 7,000 knees that have yet to bow to Baal. The love of God is there. The love of God was there in the ash sheep as Job wasn't just at the altar, but crawled upon his altar. He's broken and battered by the devil, but he found that grace did abound, and the love of God was there. Daniel found out the love of God was in Babylon. I'm glad Naomi found out the love of God was in Moab. A thief on the cross found out the love of God was on that cross. Then Lazarus found out the love of God was in that tomb. As John was on Patmos alone, he found out he wasn't alone, and he heard a voice like a trumpet and turned around to see the one we'll see one day coming for us in the clouds. And the love of God was there. And can I say there's no expiration date on that and there is no time stamp on that. It doesn't spoil rotten nor grow old. It's not a relic for the shelf. It doesn't gain dust in a museum. The love of God is alive and well tonight. And that same love of God that lassoed his children then is wrapped around you and I today. And we might doubt some things and we might lose some things and some things might be taken from your life but there's one thing you can't get away there's one thing you can't get away from there's one thing you can't outrun there's one thing you can't 
forfeit or squander, and that's God's love in Christ Jesus. Now, it's not saying my love for him, because that changes every day. But I can depend upon his love for me. The love of God is there in the home. It's there in the hospital. It's there in the hurting hour. It's there at the cradle. It's there at the crossroad. And it's there at the casket. It hears the groan and sees the tear and knows the need. It's inexhaustible, unexplainable, and it's inescapable. It's inseparable. It's the love of God that provided Christ for the sinner. It's the love of God that drew the sinner to Christ. It's the love of God that made the sinner a saint. And it's the love of God that guides the saint over the river into eternity. You can't, you can't compare anything to the love of God. It doesn't flee in the battle. It doesn't run in the storm. It doesn't flinch under the burden. It doesn't abandon you in sin. There's no who. There's no way. There's no where. There's no what, no how, never that can separate you and I from the love of God. Paul can pin and sign his amen to this based on past experience and present circumstance. Because Paul had been there, done that, and got the t-shirt for everything he lists in these verses. Paul can say, I'm telling you this, fellas, I've tried it all, I've been there, I've done that, none of it worked. Not a one of them separated me from the love of God. I've been beaten and found the love of God was there. I've been in prison and found the love of God was there. I was shipwrecked and found the love of God buoyed me in the sea. I was stoned and the love of God was there. I was let down in a basket and the love of God was there. I've been scorned and slandered, but the love of God was there. Consider how encouraging that must have been to these Roman Christians. Their circumstances, their society, the sin that they lived around. And then they hear this message, no separation? What are you talking about? We've been separated from society. They don't even want us to mingle with them. We've been separated from government. We don't even have a vote. We've been separated from our family. They think we're heretics and have disowned us. Some of them, we've been separated from our husbands. They've been arrested. We've been separated from our children. They've been taken from our arms. I can see is that Roman mother would go out in the middle of the night, and maybe she'd cry, and her heart's broken. She's heavy burdened, and she thinks, how am I going to raise a child in this city and in this generation? Uh, my husband's at, uh, in prison, and who are hiding for fear of the authorities. How are we going to make it? I can see as that man wonders, how am I going to provide for my family? I can't sell out my convictions. I've got to stand, but it might cost me my neck. And I don't know what we're going to do. And they knew what separation was, but can you imagine? Oh, happy day. When they got this letter from Paul in the mail and all of a sudden they read Romans chapter 8 and came down to that verse that said, he said, I am persuaded. He's saying, I used to be persuaded. I'm persuaded today and you can check back tomorrow and I'm going to say, persuaded that there's nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God. You might get separated from family. You might get separated from society. You might lose your job over it. You might be persecuted, but you'll find the love of God is there. Hold me fast. Let me stand in the hollow of thine hand. So there's seven verses here, and there's six different areas where he says, can this separate you from the love of God? Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, he says, no person can separate you from the love of God. Look at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yet rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He's saying there is not anybody out there that is going to go to the judgment seat of God and stand there and bring your sin before the Father and accuse you, whether it be Satan or somebody else, and say, you know what, that fellow is no good anymore, and you get booted out of the family of God and become a stranger to his love. He said, who is it that can condemn you? He said, it's Christ that justifies you. He said, you can take him back to the past atonement. He said, but he also lives to make intercession. Now you can take him to your advocate. Can I say 
there is not anybody living, whether it be the devil or somebody down the road, that can go to the Father and name your sin and accuse you of your wickedness and get you kicked out of the love of God. We have the atonement and we have an advocate. So when our adversary comes, introduce him to your advocate. He'll walk him to the mercy seat, rub his nose in the blood of Christ and say he's got no condemnation. He has been forgiven and the love of God is there. There is no person. Then he said in verse 35, there's no problem. All these different things under that big canopy of problems. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Now he's not saying you won't have any problems. He's saying there's not been one of those things yet that can get you out of the love of God. Amen. No sin, no situation, no storm, no season in life can separate you from the love of God. You might find yourself in a place that you don't love, but it's not a place where there is not love. You might find yourself in a circumstance that you don't love, but it does not mean God's love is not in the circumstance. I'm glad God's love is a trespasser. It does not obey the posted signs of any problem. It just trespasses into all of them. Wherever you go, it goes with you. Number three, he said, not only is there no person that can separate you or no problem that can separate you, there's no point in life that can separate you. Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death <clears throat> nor life. The greatest separator that we can think of is what? It's death. Death separates us from loved ones. Death separates families. Death separates spouses. Death separates friends. But here's what he says. Death can't separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Because death is just a doorway to paradise for the child of God. <clears throat> We punched our ticket to heaven the day we got saved. What are you going to threaten a Christian with? Heaven? It'll be a glad reunion in heaven. I know. Amen. Glad day. Glorious day. There will be a happy meeting. Amen. It's going to be a good day. I'll meet you in the morning by the bright riverside. It's never goodbye. It's just I'll see you soon when a Christian goes home to glory. He said there's no death that can separate you. But I like this. No life. Sometimes life is worse than death. For the Christian, dying is easy. We know we have assurance in Christ, but life can be hard. But he said nothing even pops up in life. You know what I like? He deals with the present and he deals with the perspective, life and death. But he doesn't deal with the past. You know why? Because you don't have one of those if you got saved. That was already taken care, that was already taken care of at Calvary. Number four, here's something else that can't separate you. There's no power. Look at verse 38, the second part of the verse. He said, neither death nor life, <clears throat> now think about this, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. He's saying it doesn't matter the rank, it doesn't matter the reach, it doesn't matter the renown, it doesn't matter if it's a spiritual power, spiritual wickedness in high places, if it's the devil himself, it doesn't matter if it's some appointed power uh, that's being used in an antichrist agenda. There is no power that can stand up to the child of God and sever you from the love of Christ. That's encouraging in days like this, isn't it? Then next he says there's no place. Look at verse 39. Nor height, <clears throat> nor depth. So it says it doesn't matter how high you go, how low you go. The valley, the mountain, the ups, the downs. You go to heaven, you make your bed in hell. The psalmist said it doesn't matter. You'll find he's there. And then he comes down to verse number 39, the second part. And I think he says this just because he knows he's preaching to a bunch of <clears throat> Bible-believing Christians. And they always got to critique everything. And he said, there's going to be some smart aleck out there listening to my sermon saying, but he didn't say what we're going through. So he said, let me just throw this in there for, for that person. He said, just in case I missed everybody, let me just throw this out there. Nor any other creature. You know what that means where I'm from? Not nothing ever. Mm -mm. He says all these country people talk slow. I've proved you wrong. I've already, I said, not nothing Ever. <laughs> yeah. Never, ever. I was reading one commentator said, we, any other creature. He said, that means anything in this universe or if there's another universe or another universe because there's only one creator. He's on our side. No creature. 
That means you just fill in the blank of what you think it is or what you've done or what you've thought or where you're at or what you're feeling. And I'll guarantee you this right now. If you're saved, then God loves you. And there's nothing you can do to lose that. You say, well, I better get right with God. No, positionally, you're already right with God and cannot be anything but right with God because you're in Christ Jesus. So here it is. You don't have to struggle with your salvation because it's not in you. It's in Christ Jesus. You don't have to struggle with worth because it's not about your worth. We're all unworthy, but he was, and you're in Christ Jesus. You don't have to struggle with the fear, can I get it done? You can't get it done, but you're in Christ Jesus, and Jesus can get it done. Every point of that pool was over the head of my boy. He's as tall as this. But it didn't depend upon his ability to stand in the water as long as I held him fast. And tonight, it does not depend upon your ability to keep your head above the water because we are safe in the arms of the Lord. What assurance. Satan is not stronger than his love. Sin is not stronger than his love. Circumstances are not stronger than his love. Your feelings are not stronger than his love. Your love for him is not stronger than his love. Death, life, eternity, not stronger than his love. Paul said, I know whom I've believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed in him against that day. We're in Christ. That's where we are. When are we in Christ? Always. How are we in Christ? Via the love of God. I thought about this and I'll close. Sandwiched preacher in the, in the midst of these verses. I mean right in the middle of it all. That's where Paul anchored verse 37. Nay, we're more than conquerors. What a message. In the midst of all of that mess, we're still conquerors. But not just conquerors, we're more than a conqueror. You say, what's more than a conqueror? That's one who cannot be conquered ever. <laughs> and it's through him that loved us. So maybe you're here tonight and you drug yourself in here and you've been battling doubt or fear or whatever it is. Just let it go. You're anchored in the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. I'm going to pray the altar be open. Maybe you need to come and just say, thank you, Lord, for loving me. Isn't it amazing that he'd love us? For God so loved the world, you can comprehend that. But then you think, but he loves me. That's kind of hard to understand. <clears throat> but I'm glad for the love of God. I'm going to pray the altar be open. You come if God spoke to your heart. Spend some time in prayer. We're a son. We have security. There'll be suffering, but he's going to see us safe to the shore. Lord, I pray that you bless tonight. Thank you for the privilege to preach the Bible. Thank you for the word of God. I pray it help our church family tonight. Thank you for the love of God in Christ Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand our feet if you would. The altar is open. If you want to come spend some time in prayer, why don't you come talk to the Lord tonight? Maybe you just want to come and say thank you to Jesus. How long has that been since you just spent a little bit of time at an altar and just thanked the Lord for loving you? Calvary, that is love displayed, that is love poured out, that is love manifested. And when you got saved, you entered into the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Thank God for that. You can't name the thing that can separate you. You're in his hand. You are his hand. Think about it. We're safe and secure in the arms of God tonight. As she plays, altar's open. Why don't you come? Maybe you've been struggling with your salvation. You doubt in your salvation. <clears throat> your security is not dependent upon your performance. It's dependent upon your position. And you entered into that position by faith, not by feelings. You take God at his word. God's not a liar. What about that? I'm glad he loves us. We sing the song sometimes in Sunday school. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. This I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. Greater love hath no man than this. Can't describe it. Can't comprehend it. But it's there. It's constant. The most constant thing in this world that you could think of is not as constant as that. Isn't that a blessing? Why don't you pray a little bit for pastors and workers conferences? This is our last invitation before Sunday. Maybe you just want to pray for that meeting as well. You pray till you're through. If you need someone to pray with you as well, let us know. We have workers and people that can pray with you. And they want to, too. They want to help you with it if you need it.
Father, it's been a wonderful, wonderful evening in your house. Our services are really brief, but in the midst of that brief brevity we get to hear, we have heard those cousins all sing. What a beautiful song. And Brother Jackson singing and the congregational singing and the offering and the, a bulletin and then a powerful, powerful message. And an amazing invitation where people flood down these aisles. We've been refreshed. We've been encouraged. We thank you for the middle of the week that you give us this oasis. Now I pray that you give us safety to our homes and our place of rest. And as folks begin to fly in and drive into this place on uh, Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and then on Monday, I pray that you give safety to each of our friends. Lord, give our people here uh, a desire to want to be in every service. I just believe that something's going to be said that will change their life. And I look for that in my own life. Bless each one of the children's program now as they close her down. In Jesus' name, amen. Great crowd. You know, on Wednesday, I know you're coming in from work and all, and it starts off slow, it looks like, about 6.20. But it always fills up. And a great crowd upstairs here and down below. And a great message tonight. I want you to pray. Brother Bertram said something a couple years ago. I think it was in College Chapel or with our staff. He said, I try at the end of the day, look back, what did I learn today? I don't know if he said it exactly, but what did I learn today? That's what I've been praying for this conference. My, my heart was totally changed in 1977, 78 at a conference with one word. That's all it was, one word. My ministry has pivoted from that one word. That one word literally changed my life. And I'd like preachers and delegates and even all of us to come and look for a statement, look for a word, look for something that's said, and let your life hinge from what God is going to give you. God will always give you something. That was so, so wonderful tonight. Let's straighten up the pew rack, if you will. I do want to remind you, I don't know how Brother, uh, Brother Romero has this. I don't know if you begin downstairs and come upstairs. I think that's how it is. But this auditorium will be cleaned. And for some reason, if you cannot have a babysitter, it's best if you could get a babysitter. But let's say you cannot and they sit in the front row. Let's not play tag all through the auditorium. Our Brother Cooper is going to have to vacuum everything and clean it all up again. It's all going to be done, so let's look forward to that. Thank you for your labor already. I don't know if the convention center is going to be open on Sunday, but it's getting set up, and there's been construction going on. And I know many displayers are coming in on Monday. Their items have been set here. And it's just going to be a wonderful time. I love you dearly. God bless you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.